Thank you very much for attending our session. Today, we are going to talk about strategies for efficient LM deployments in any cluster. My name is Angel, and I'm part of the AI and Advanced Services team in, the, in Bradcom. And today, I'm here with Francisco. Hey, my name is Francisco Cabrera. I'm a senior technical program manager at the Azure Agent Platform team. So just to set a little bit the expectations for this talk, the goal is that we will learn different strategies to run, operate, and improve models while working on our, on our um, specific use cases. Setting also the appropriate infrastructure so we can run them in different environments, not only in a big cluster and a huge cloud, but also in a small deployments, like on-premise, inside stores, on anywhere in which you want to run them. For that, we will talk about local caching, OCI for models, GPU usage. And you may be familiar with these terms after like being here at KubeCon for, for one day. Also, we will focus on a small and medium Kubernetes deployments, nothing about like AI service provider or mega cluster for distributed training, but more something that you can deploy in your on-premise clusters. But before starting with the strategies and discussing a little bit more about that, the first thing you may ask yourself if, is why you would like, why you'd consider to deploy LLMs that are already a huge offering outside with a lot of really good models that you can just access them via API, so you don't need to host, install, and manage those ones. But there are 13 good reasons to, to deploy them and manage. The first thing is that you have more control and flexibility. If you start using one of those services, most likely you will have access to the models, that the proprietary models that they offer, but you won't have the ability to experiment with new models, go small, try new things. Um, that may impact also the cost, because now you are tied to the cost of the service that you, that you choose. Also because any company can actually access to those services, and you can access get um, and use those models. But the real difference between any of the components that we are here is the data that you have. But maybe certain regulations, like if you work on a government or by other reason, because you don't want to move your data to the services, you want to keep it private. So deploying LMs locally may give you access to that data that otherwise you cannot use. Um, based on that, you can also find in the models. There is a huge offering on the open source side for machine learning models, and you can take advantage of your data, combine it with these models, and create new models that fit for your use case and perform better for, for your users. And when talking about efficiency, what we mean is that, first, you provision the minimal resources that you need to complete a task without compromising the stability of the system, of course. You don't want like, to go to the minimum and then yes, one spike breaks the entire system. Um, based on the resources that you allocated, you want uh, not to have either uh, hardware. You want to use them properly, um, not just wasting energy and time like running them. But now let's put some numbers about energy consumption, which is one of the measures that you may hear about for green energy and green code. For that, I'm going to take as an example the Bloom um, large language model. Bloom is a research project that, in the end, end up with a 160, uh, sorry, 76 billion parameter model that was trained on 1.6 terabytes of data. So the, mm, the interesting point of this, whoops, okay, it works. The interesting thing of this of this model is that the research team was collecting all the energy data while while, while they were developing and training this this model. Um, shall we? Okay, maybe I think we can connect it directly. It's on the other side. Yes, one second. Should work. Okay, here we go. So while they were trying in this huge model, they started to collecting all the metrics that they need. So just to give you some numbers, they they took to train this specific model, it took like 120 days to try. And the total energy that they spent was about 400,000 uh, kilowatts per hour. So to give you a little bit a comparison with some data that may sound more familiar to you and now that we are in Paris, this means the same energy as the average of 61 French homes or French houses in a year, which 
to be honest, at least for me, I'm a, this is a personal per perception, is not that big because we are millions of people here in France. And this is one-time effort. So you spend the time like training this model, and now you have this model ready to be used at inference. So you don't need to retrain it over and over. So that said, the important thing for all of us, because I think like most of the people that are here are going to use large language model, but not to train them, is that we optimize for energy efficiency at inference. So the system that we build to provide value to our customers requires less resources and less energy. And in other words, it costs less money for us. So now let's talk a little bit about the strategies that we can follow to, to get efficient LM deployments. The first thing is about model selection. For sure, if we go like to the biggest model that we can find out there, like GPT-4 or Mixtral, there are huge models that provide really, really good results and accuracy when you are like asking many different kind of things. And the reason is that they are big and they were trained with a lot of data. But on the other side, the bigger the model is, the most energy it consumes to run it. So based on this great paper, they started to test the inference energy that they were consuming based on the LAMA family. So they were comparing 7 billion, 13, and 65 billion. And as you can see, the biggest is the model. It can even triple the energy that you need. So for many tasks, you can go to the biggest model, and they will perform for sure pretty well. But you can also go into the opposite direction. Like, let's try to find the smallest model that can perform well for your use case. And now, that way, it's more efficient than actually trying to get the biggest model for everything. And you can combine them. So you can use a small model for certain things and big models for other tasks. The other thing is about quantization, which is a pretty popular technique for anyone that wants to try a machine learning model, but you don't have actually like access to a powerful NVIDIA GPU. So quantization is a technique that reduces the model size by reducing the precision. So basically, you have, like you can see in the table on the right, there are a comparison in the LAMA family that shows the perplexity, which is one of the scores that you can use to measure the accuracy of, the, of a model. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. Um, here, you see like the comparison between full precision with 16 bits, and then quantization models that were reducing that precision to 4 bits, 4.1, 5 bits, etc. So if we compare it and we look at this number, the perplexity for the uh, 7 billion model at full precision is 5.9. Uh, just in case, the, for this specific score, lower is better. And if you compare it with the perplexity of the 13 billion parameter, but now quantized to 4.1 uh, 4 bits, those always beat the full precision of the 7 billion model. And if we compare now the sizes, you can see they are pretty small. They are almost half of the size of those models, um, meaning that for running the quantized model, you need less memory, and they are faster than others. And this is a pretty, pretty hot ecosystem. Microsoft, I think, like two or three weeks ago, you announced like a new paper about um, a quantization of 1.5 bits, which is kind of almost anything. Um, the good thing about this is that it, it uh, raises pretty promising um, benchmarks, like being 2.7 times faster than others while keeping more or less the accuracy using 3.5 less, uh, less GPU memory, which is for me really, really amazing. The other thing that we can consider is that until now, we have been talking about large language models, but there is also a new category, which is called small uh, language models, which, by the way, the acronym is, is wrong. So this, this is from a post in, in LinkedIn from Clem, the CEO of Hagen Face. And he was mentioning, like, not only in LinkedIn, but in many places, that small, cheaper, faster, and customized models could be the future, because it will cover many, many use cases for different, for different companies. Um, we have, since last year, I think, we have a pretty good uh, number of small language models available for, the, for, for use. So just to show you some example, we have Phi2 from Microsoft, Gemma2 Billion from Google, and we have Gwen 1.5 from Alibaba. And Gwen actually came in different sizes, like 0.4, I think, is the smallest one. And then the biggest one is around like, like, Lama, oops, like the Lama big models. 
And the cool thing about these models is that customizing, or in other words, when you are doing it for machine learning, fine tuning those models is pretty, pretty cheap. Because thanks to the size of these models, you don't need huge uh, graphic cards and powerful ones to do the fine tuning. So you can take them as a base model, not meaning that it's generic good enough when they are generic for most of the tasks. For that, you need to use, to use like bigger models. But you can take them, and then you can take your private data, retraining them, and adding those small layers using different techniques, like, for example, LoRa layers. And the cool thing, and we will talk a little bit more about LoRa layers later, is that LoRa layers can be independent from the base model. So they are really good for catching, because you have the base model, which is Phi, Gemma 2 billion, or Quem. And then you have a set of LoRa layers that can be fine-tuned for different, uh, different use cases inside your company. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty, really good um, approach. And the other thing that I wanted to mention here is that there are also advances on to moving the workloads that we currently run in cluster or on in the cloud to actually the user devices. And this is not something new. We have seen like Google, for example, using machine learning in Android devices like for a long time. But the good thing and why I wanted to mention WebAssembly here is that it simplifies a lot the way in which you can do that. Now you can have machine learning engines that can run even in the browser, in your mobile phone. And then you can use the same exact models that you are running in your cluster, but now moving them into the user device. And even fine tuning them for very specific user because they are small enough, so they are easy to train and easy to distribute to your, to your users. And that said, we are moving about how to make it everything on Kubernetes. Well, thank you. I think that was a great introduction to the different type of models, right, and how to use them. Uh, but now let's talk a bit about, you know, how we bring those models to Kubernetes. And, you know, just when you have the model, generally the big issue is how you, you actually host the model in these production deployments. Um, you know, like you need to get the GPU, you need to get your resources, right, and they cost money. So you need to actually, you know, find a way to actually bring the models, right, to this Kubernetes cluster in a secure and efficient way. Um, so the first thing you need to do is actually make sure you define your architecture. Probably you'll go through, you know, more like a microservices approach. You want to make sure that, you know, your GPU is being used when you actually need it, right? If you actually move into the cloud, you want to actually make sure that you're using more like, you know, serverless, right? So you're paying whatever you're using. Um, at the same time, we, we all use these models, right? And generally the way we use it is we just go, we ask a question, get a, we get a response, we ask another question, we're done with our probably with the code that we don't know, uh, and that's it. So we want to make sure that we scale up, we scale down when we're done, right? So we, made, we want to make sure that we're actually using that you know, scalability in a kind of a good way. Um, and the, the third part is that probably a lot of these models, maybe they're being part of critical applications, and we want to make sure that we have a unified deployment between cloud and edge, and we want to move, right, if needed, right, from edge to cloud or from cloud to edge whenever needed. So we're going to go over. Um, you know, kind of a really simple architecture, so uh, you can have you know, your ingress or gateway, you'll have your, your auto scaler, your proxy, that's, you know, again, depending on your architecture, your AI service, um, and then, you know, the interesting part is around, you know, the inferencing part with the model loader, um, the GPU operator, and of course, the, you know, the LLM storage. So we're going to be talking all the blue kind of pieces here. Um, so let's go ahead and start from right uh, all the way to left. So let's start with the models. Uh, in the end, models, as you know, like uh, Angel was saying, they're just big binary, binary style, you know, files. Um, and because they're just so big, right, the closer you get them to your Kubernetes cluster, the better. Um, you can actually see, for example, here in examples, like, well, when you're using small SML models, you're in the 3.75 gig kind of size. It's big, but still manageable, right? We, we can still manage that. Uh, but as you grow, more right into more complex model, like, you know, 7 billion, it just goes into 13, 14, right? And it's going to really big ones, right? The, the Llama 70 billion were already you know, 140 gigs, so it's just pretty, pretty complicated. And to that, you, of course, you need to add you know, your container, your application, CUDA, drivers, you know, so it just gets really, really big. Um, so you need to actually think of how you're going to be distributing this in a secure and efficient way. And the different methods, right, you could use like blob storage, you could use, you know, short side, you know, URLs, 
Um, in particular, what you've been you know, kind of doing a bit of research is actually how you leverage the infrastructure that you have. And there were great talks today about like, how you can actually leverage you know, the OCI infrastructure. Um, so basically what you can do is you can just use the same kind of container registries that you're using and actually put all your weights there. Um, and by doing that, you're getting a lot of benefits, right? You already solve, right, for example, auth and RBAC for all your other kind of containers. So you just use the same that you're using there. Um, you will get other, other benefits, like you, know, you have the layering, you have the hashing for each of the different chunks that you'll be doing. Um, you have the retrial mechanism, which is also you know, really important when you're kind of on these network constrained devices. Um, and of course, then because of chunking, right, you'll just you know you'll have you know, better performance when you're kind of packing and unpacking these kind of uh, big files. So how does it work? First of all, choose your model format. The different model kind of formats you have, you know, like the binary. You have PyTorch. You have HDF5. So recently, Hugging Face they open source a new kind of format. It's called Safe Tensors. It has a bunch of kind of advantages over you know the previous formats. It's it's open source. It's quite new, so probably there's some models that you won't find you know this uh, specific format, but it's it's quite kind of uh, easy to you know move from let's say part to PyTorch to Safe Tensor. Um, as soon as you have that model, what you would do is you need to kind of define what's going to be your optimal division and divide into smaller chunks. So again, these Safe Tensor files are big. So you need to just put it into small chunks so that, you know, depending on your network, right, maybe you want to do 500 MB, you want to do 200. Again, depends on your scenario. Um, and as soon as you have that, then you just go ahead and upload these kind of uh, the chunks into uh, your container registry. In particular here, like we're using ORAS. So ORAS is an open source a CNCF uh, tool that allows you to use, you know, OCI kind of uh, register. Um, um, container registries and upload all these model weights as OCI artifacts. So it's pretty simple. You just use the kind of the same approach as you're doing with containers, where you just do, you know, like instead of like Docker push, just or push, right? You just put what's your specific kind of uh, format. You could just create a format, let's say, of safe tensors, and you just push it. So here's just an example. I got a, a model which was like, I think it was 5 GB. I just like chunk it right into 500 MB pieces. Then I just go ahead, I upload, and I can see there as part of you know, Azure Container Registry. Um, almost all container registries right now on the cloud, they already support these kind of OCI artifacts, so you should be fine. Um, and as you can see there, you can see the, you know, the manifest JSON, and it has all the different layers are the different kind of chunks of you know, something like 500 MBs. So once you have that, right, you have your model there and your OCI kind of registry, what you need to do is actually download it. And because we chunk it, we need to recreate that. But again, it's, it's a really simple task. You can use Aura's kind of SDK. You have it for your Python, for Go, Rust. And what you do end up doing is just every time you download a chunk, you just copy it right to you know, the kind of final model. And as soon as you finish, you just like delete you know, the kind of the, the different chunks. Um, and then once you have that, I just put here a you know, sample code of how easy it is to actually load the base model, and then you can also load the custom kind of lower layers. So for example, in our demo, what we're going to be doing is we're going to load a base uh, Phi2 uh, model, and then we're going to put the fine-tuned lower layers. The also, the good part of this is that you can actually have multiple lower layers. So let's say you have a specific lower layer for your marketing kind of team. Well, that's one layer. You have another layer for, let's say, HR team. Um, and you're going to have the same base model, which is going to be Phi2. The other kind of good practice that you can do is actually have local caching or your peer and your peer to peer alternative. So yeah, there's some really you know, good projects out there like Spiegel, which in the end what they're doing is this local mirroring of these kind of uh, artifacts. Uh, so basically what it does is uh, every time somebody looks for a container or any kind of layer, let's call any OCI artifact, it will actually talk in, inside the cluster and see if any other node has already that layer. If so, it will just like serve it directly. And if not, it will go to the container registry and get it. Um, recently, I think it was yesterday, also Azure team announced there's a new pr project, open source project that's called PRD, that is doing a kind of similar, this peer-to-peer -peer communication and caching, but that, you know, one of the advantages is that also doing for other kind of technologies, not only OCI, but also, for example, for blob storage, or kind of, and also supporting uh, artifact streaming. So a bit of numbers here. I just did this on you know, my local cluster. I just download uh, the CUDA container, which is something like 3.8 gigs. I downloaded first on the node one. It took something like 151 seconds. And then what I did, I changed it into node two, 
right? But because it was already part of node one, it was actually, you know, like it was served by node one right on my kind of local network. And it's just like 5.7 seconds, 28 faster. This will actually depend on your, your network infrastructure, your Kubernetes cluster, but you can see results between 10x to 50x generally. So now, the, you know, one of the other parts here is just, you know, get the GPU, of course, and when you're using GPUs, what is that you need to take into account? And of course, first, you need to go ahead and set up your node. There are different kind of pieces that you need to take into account. You know, the NVIDIA drivers, the container toolkit, the container runtime. Um, and one of you know, the important kind of pieces here is also what, how you define your Kubernetes device allocation. Uh, if anyone like was today in the keynote, you know, we are, you know, the NVIDIA team actually talked a bit about you know, what's you know, the, the DRA driver and all the benefits that you get with that and what are the kind of limitations with the kind of device plugin right now. Like for example, right, you cannot assign more than one type of GPU for a specific node. Um, you can, there's some limitation when you're sharing that GPU between containers. And you know, all those are already being sold right now with you know, KDS DRA driver. Only issue is you're still in, you know, kind of an alpha version, but probably, you know, if, you know, if that's okay with you, you can just go ahead and start testing. Um, once that you also have, you know, defined what's your de device allocation, you need to make sure what, how you're going to access, you know, that, that kind of uh, CUDA or your GPU. And there are different ways, right? So you have, like, you know, it should be a single process, but also, right, you could be, like, M when it comes to concurrent access, you can be MPS, you can be time slicing, virtual GPUs, and again, you, it's going to, depend on what's your use cases, kind of what you're going to be defining as the axis. And then the final thing is around the application logic. So you need to take into account, okay, what are you going to be doing if it's GPU on fallback to CPU? If you're going to be doing lower layers, well, make sure that you also you could use, for example, safe tensor for lazy loading and just loading, you know, the layers that you need. Um, and also, how are you going to host that model? Are you, are you going to be using a framework? So there are different frameworks to host the model. You have you have Olama, you have like uh, VLLM, you have uh, Open Open LLM. So make sure also that you define that logic based on you know these kind of frameworks that they are already available. Um, and then the final thing is around custom scaling. Uh, so again, because these kind of uh, application generally just like you go, you type something, you finish, then you know, and then you're not using that anymore. Probably you need to make sure that you have a good kind of logic around how you scale up and scale down. Uh, so you could use Kida, right, uh, in order to actually have this event-driven kind of um, auto scaling. Uh, you need to make sure also that if you're going to be using GPU, you use right the DCA GMM uh, NVIDIA exporter so that you can get all the GPU metrics. And then finally, just make sure you're also using right your own logic and your custom metrics. So you could use like metrics like latency, tokens per second, right? What's the GPU utilization? And getting all these metrics done, then you can actually go ahead and create your kind of uh, scaler um, for your Kubernetes cluster. So now let's let's go ahead and show you a demo of, you know, end-to-end -end of trying to apply all these things that we've been talking. Um, and to give you a bit of context here, so the demo that we end up doing, we wanted to do a, like, a simple demo, but kind of, you know, like useful in your real world. So imagine, you know, you're working for an HR company that is just actually receiving a lot of, you know, emails and resumes, right? They're like from multiple countries, multiple language. And in the end, what you want to do is some filtering. You want to make sure that you abstract information based on those emails and you just put it, for example, in a database. So for example, you get something, hey, my name is Angel, I'm 32 years old, I live in Sevilla, and I'm working as a software engineer, probably write a resume. And what you want to do is, hey, just get this JSON that is extracting the information, right, and just creating you know, this new final JSON file. So we actually went and say, okay, based on this kind of application, let's go ahead and try the you know, online models. So we tried with Mistral, 7 billion. It worked quite good. We tried with Gemma, quite good. And then we, when we tried with Phi 2 and Gemma 2 billion, it was, it was okay, but had a couple of mistakes, right? So we say, okay, let's go ahead and try to see if we can actually fine tune this and use the base Phi 2 model and create a, you know, a lower layer and see how it works. So what we ended up doing there was we created you know, a synthetic data set. So we went there like online, we created, I think it was uh, 100,000 lines of you know, these examples. Then we, went, we go ahead and we train, we fine tune this Phi 2 model um, and actually try to see what happened right, when we were running uh, the fine tune model in our cluster. Okay, so now Angel is going to demonstrate this live of how this works. So, oops. Is okay. It here? Okay, can you? Yeah. I'm going to do this. Okay, so let me clear this. Um, 
Cool. So with, with, we did like with the with the fight to uh, fine tuning. So we train it, but in a real environment, you may think like this is going to be more of a work for a machine learning engineers. So at this point, what we did is like we fine tune this model pretty pretty simple, and then we have this model available in our OCI registry. So you're going to start right away using it. So the first thing that we need to do is actually to deploy it. And as, as Francisco was mentioning, there are many different frameworks and services that you can use for this. In this case, we use VLLM. So how it looks in reality is if we go to the configuration file, and then we see like the inference YAML file. Here you can see that we are defining a pod that comes with an init container. This is because, as, as um, Francisco was mentioning, for the OCI uh, registry, we need to download all the different layers and recompose all the files. So this is part of the, of the init container that we, are, that we have here. And then we're loading it in a, mol in a volume. And then we, we are using the VLM uh, container right away. We don't need to perform any modification, just to load it from the folder that was downloaded before. Um, in this case, we are using a local cluster using kind, so this is the way like we are asking for the cluster to allocate one specific GPU to run this, this example. So we can see like the result of the of the init container. So let me like do keep CTL logs VLM. Yeah, so basically the, yeah, basically the init container is just downloading all the, all the layers and then just packing back to the original model. It's just really simple Python code. So here, as you can see, it's a pretty simple uh, Python code. It's just like with what Francisco said. At the end, you can see like the final files that happen after all the reconstruction. This took time, so that's why we made it like before the, the presentation. Um, after this, this is like uh, available, we can see on the VLLM service is now like ready to start receiving receiving responses. And this was based on a fine-tuned model, and it was pretty simple. We don't have to run any custom code, just use the same uh, service that, that we have. But now we have a fine-tuned model. So now let's try to run it. So for this, I have a pretty simple um, inference test.py file. Here, what you can find is that we are using the OpenAI um, library because VLLM exposes an open AI API compatible layer, so we don't need to create any custom SDK. Here, just for simplicity, we are adding the text inside. So here, instead of having like a short description like before, we can add it a little bit longer one with some information around. And then we have the prompt in which we are adding the instruction about to, hey, extract this information, this is the format that we want, just skip things before and after, and then give me the output with the final JSON. So let's try it. So now if I run like Python inference uh, P, I need to put like the URL P1. We are good. So in the result, like we see, like we have already the JSON that we wanted to extract in the right format. Um, then after performing some tests, you can see like it's giving a little bit more accuracy. Of course, this is synthetic data, so we cannot expect like a really, really good accuracy when you seem like in real with real data. But since you can now access to the private data that you have in your company, you can fine tune with this data and improve over and over. And since fine tuning is so cheap you can do it like iteratively and constantly. And just to finalize this demo, the cool thing about this, at least for me, is that everything that you saw here from the fine tuning to the, to the running of this entire model is actually running in NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3060, which is a 300 bucks uh, graphic card with 12 gigabytes of memory. So you don't need to have like huge graphic cards to run this kind of, of models, and you can use this maybe for doing some specific task inside the stores, or in any edge deployment that you want, and you cannot put um, like a thousand dollars graphic cards on every store that, that your company owns. Yeah, and with that, thank you so much, and yeah, I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions. Okay. I think
think you can go yeah to the microphone. Cool, thank you for talk. Yeah, so I have a quick question. So when we put the model in the OCI ser uh, compatible server, uh, when we download the model in our code, we have existing library like Hugging Face or other PyTorch code can download from the OCI registry directly, or you have to use some init container to download it. So as far as I know, there is no like, direct tool inside the Hugging Face Transformer library to download using the OCI layer. But I believe like, in the future, it will be some kind of adapter that you can use right away with the Transformer library so it downloads it directly. But I think as today, there is no library. OK, for cool. It. Cool, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> OK, so cool. Thank you very much.